Hey everyone and welcome back to the Retro Channel. This is part two of the C64 Repair-a-thon. Uh, so this time we're going to be looking at this bread bin and one of the other ones that's probably this one down here. Um, so we've already checked out the other three so if you haven't seen the first part um, I'd recommend checking that out. Uh, but apart from that let's dive straight in to the remaining C64C and then we'll Get on to the bread bin. Okay, so first one up is, uh, I guess we'd call it C64C number four. Uh, I'll think of a good name for it later on. It is a little bit yellowed, especially the keys. Um, and of course, before we apply power, I just want to open it up and see what we're looking at. All right, ah. It looks like a short board, which would be the first short board that I've ever really done any work on. So we'll call this one short board, I guess. Let's take the keyboard out and have a closer look. Ah, it's so tiny. Well, everything looks to be there. Um, everything also looks to be dirty. There's like a Part of a stick, a little bit of crap on the board, almost looks like maybe moulds the way it's sort of collected in little spots. Ew! The joys of working on vintage computers. Okay. Tiny little board compared to what I'm used to. That's what she said. Well, it looks pretty good underneath. Only thing left to do is power it up. All right, let's power it up. No smoke. Oh, we have a startup screen. We also have a white blinking cursor. Uh, so that is not right. Um, can just do another. Ooh, that was weird. Nope, oh, white blinking cursor. Right. Given that it's a short board, at least there's not as much to look at. Uh, so I guess it could be the um, the Super PLA. What else have we got here? So there's two CIA chips. Uh, there's our SID chip, the 8580 revision. Uh, that looks like supporting the timer. That's our VIC-2, the newer revision. This has absolutely nothing on it, but I, th I think that's the color RAM of, from memory. Some of these boards, I think the earliest revision short boards have a separate color RAM chip. And I think the later ones it's integrated into this guy. 41464 so that's our 64k ram um cpu roms i think the the kernel and the character rom are integrated or the kernel and the basic are integrated into one um yeah obviously the other cia and this is just some 74 logic now we probably don't need to check any voltages most of this stuff runs just off the five volts so you can see there's lack of regulators and not too many field caps this voltage regulator over here yeah i think the cassette port still needs that to function um, to get the right voltage so yeah i'm hoping it's not the super pla so we'll start with the color ram i'll pull that off the board put a replacement in and see if that fixes our issue all right so this is being especially stubborn um, and it's definitely not safe to remove it um, I know it's still being held in there so I'm gonna use some hot air to make sure those solder joints are flowing before we try and pull the chip I'm just gonna stick a bit of Kapton tape on these adjacent components just to protect them from the heat all right so we're just gonna 
Move the air gun around. And just sort of start prying from one side. And I may start melting my bench, potentially. Alright, so the chip is out, it's probably quite hot, and we haven't done any damage to the board. And minimal damage to my mat underneath. Yes, prop it up if you're doing this sort of work. Um, because the board get will, will get very hot and it'll just, that heat will just absorb into whatever's underneath it. But um, yeah, that looks good, so we can clear out those holes and put a socket in. And everything... Next to it looks to have survived. I'm just going to first test it with our suspect ram just to see if it's still doing the same thing. Yeah, so we've still got that white cursor. The good thing is I haven't broken anything else, so let's swap out the color ram and hope for a fix. The writing has pretty much disappeared off this even before I heated it up. I think it's a Sanyo chip, but that is literally all I can tell you. Um, let's see what happens. Ah, still a white cursor. Oh, I guess I, at least I know this chip's still good, so I'll put that back in. Okay, so from looking at the pictorial fault guide, um, the color ram looked very similar uh, to the issue I was having, but obviously it's not the color ram unless it's a damaged trace nearby, but I'm starting to move away from the color ram. I think what I might do, um, which is probably something I should have done earlier, is, is pull the socketed chips and just clean out these sockets. Uh, I can even leave the SID chip out and just see if that makes any difference. All right, let's see. Nope, still white cursor. So SID chip can go back in. I don't think there's any risk to that. Um, let's just try the dead test just to see if that gives us any hints. Start off with the dead test which takes a second to come up on screen. That should have appeared by now. Oh. Yeah, okay. Again, I think I've got a, a bad power switch. Yep. So I'll have to pull that off and fix it, but that still doesn't, you know, well, that still isn't going to fix our strange color issue. Once again, if you saw the last video, these just pop open from the sides with a flathead screwdriver. And carefully pull this off, trying not to drop anything out of it. Those contacts at first glance don't look too bad. Now, here's something interesting. There is a sort of grease on these, which is what I suspected with the last switch that we pulled out in the last video. So I think the grease in that had sort of liquefied by, you know, if if there's contact cleaner sprayed in there or something, it could liquefy the grease 
and that could end up on the actual contacts, which is what you don't want. Um, and I think also if you're a fan of like washing your board, um, obviously getting liquid inside the switch is not ideal because yeah, this stuff will end up, well, could end up on the contacts, which means you're going to need to pull the switch off and clean it out properly. So, um, I don't wash boards. I mean, I know a lot of people do and they have good success with it and there goes contact, but I, I just, I don't know, something about washing a board, submerging it in, in any kind of fluid really, um, especially water just, just doesn't sit well with me. Um, anyway, let's see if we can clean this up a bit. The contacts actually look okay. So it could just be that um, it was a bad connection on the actual, between the switch and the, the main circuit board itself. But anyway, I'll clean these up just a little, just to be sure, while we've got it out. Okay, so our switch has been cleaned up and reinstalled, and it looks like it comes on pretty instantly. Let's just run the dead test and see if it brings up any issues. I do have the, the diagnostic harness also installed, but um, it's not using that on the dead test. We just want to see if it brings up any errors or faults, and it should be popping up around now. Maybe not. Well, that ain't even working. Maybe I should disconnect all this stuff. Well, that's interesting. It's not very dead test like. I mean, it, it does look dead, but not the result I was expecting. Hmm. So switch is working well, um, but this clearly isn't. Uh, let's switch over to the diagnostic and see if it can boot that air. All right, that looks like bad color RAM. Um, So even though we still had the white cursor with the replacement color RAM, I think this one is, is definitely bad. Let's just do it one more time. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that, that looks like bad color RAM. In fact, I can remove the color RAM and it'll pretty much look the same. So I don't know. Yeah, see, there you go. It looks the same. So I don't know if this was bad. Um, before I pulled it out or whether I cooked it pulling it out but um, yeah given that it like the writing is basically non-existent on the top even before I pulled it out um, that does seem to suggest that it's possibly been overheating for a while oh well, that looks better I think I had some bad contact there, but it still doesn't look right though. The um, the box around the the ICs and the RAM chips is half red, half blue. So and some of the letters and numbers are also messed up. Let's see what the color RAM test does. Okay, the color RAM test passed, so maybe it's just because I pulled this off the board and the legs are quite short on this, so I might just try and fix those up a little bit. Well, that's a little bit better, at least they're more or less straight. All right, so it's, <clears throat> it's just sort of sitting just in the socket. I just want to see what it does. Okay, it's still happy. Yeah, maybe just had a bad contact first up. Okay, 
Let's go back to the dead test and try that again. There's some junk on the screen because it, it doesn't look like it's cleared everything completely. Oh yeah, the dead test is up. Um, this probably looks a little bit different if you've seen other Commodore 64 repair videos. Um, this dead test is, uh, is available on GitHub, so it's a, a modified version of the, um, the original dead test. Um, so I will put a link to that down below. Um, the biggest difference is obviously the screen is a different color, but you do have color bars along the bottom as well. And it also runs through a, a filters test on the SID chip. So, um, if it makes it that far, you will get to hear that as well. Right, and then the next cycle, the, the outer border color changes and goes through again. So it changes every time it runs a cycle, um, goes through different border colors. All right, let's go back to the diagnostic and hook up the full harness. Hmm. So the keyboard and user port have been marked as bad. Um, let's just boot it up again normally. The cursor is the right color now. That's weird. I'll just reset it. Yep. Right. Something strange is going on. Uh, Yeah. The only real difference I've made apart from fixing up the power switch is, is connecting this harness and reseeding that color ram, but still normal. Maybe it was just that wasn't seated properly, but that's still giving us an error and the, the diagnostic colors look off, so surely there's something else going on. That is a white cursor. So I removed the keyboard loop back and the cursor color changed back to white. Now it's normal. And it, as soon as I pull it off without even restarting, it changes to white. So I'll put it back on and reset back to normal. Even just pulling up half of that changes to white. So we've either got an issue with this keyboard connector, which does have some scummy filth around it, or one of the CIAs. I dare say. So I'm going to forget about the Super PLA. I think we're good there. The Vic 2, I think is good as well. And we're going to focus our attention on the CIAs and this keyboard connector, because there's, there's an issue going on around here somewhere. I've just got to figure it out in my head what to look at first. Um, maybe I should clean up the board first. That's a good idea. So I went around after cleaning up the board and inspected some of these suspect looking traces just to make sure there wasn't any corrosion underneath the solder mask, but everything still seems to be connected as it should be. Uh, I had to replace that little cap that had the leg that 
pretty much just disintegrated the moment I touched it. So I've just replaced the whole capacitor. Um, and I think our next step is to remove the first CIA. So the CIA in U1 um, and see if that brings us any joy because the keyboard connectors pretty much directly connected to U1 um, before going off everywhere else. Um, there's only a few pins that aren't actually connected to U1. So we'll re pull that CIA, put a different one in and see if that brings us any joy. <laughs> I sees on this board are quite annoying because the legs on a lot of them are really short and they're all splayed out to the side. So it makes it tricky to desolder them cleanly. And I'll definitely have to do another run over most of the pins. In fact, almost all the pins are still being held in by a bit of solder. So yeah, it's pretty annoying, but we'll get there. Patience is key here. Okay, so even after three attempts with the desoldering gun, I can see there's definitely still solder on the top side. Um, so I'm going to hit it with the heat gun and hopefully we can safely melt all these solder joints and remove this chip. I'd say by now, if it's not dead already, it's probably going to be dead by the end of this. Um, I've never had so much issues with a with a single board. Um, I think initial impressions, this board didn't look too bad, but now I'm realizing that it, it actually is in pretty rough shape. And um, yeah, these ICs are being very stubborn. Um, and unfortunately, the one I need to get out seems to have the pins cut the shortest. They, the camera probably won't even be able to pick it up, but they barely make it through the board. And they're all splayed out, so yeah. Definitely set myself up for a challenge here, but I don't want to keep going around with the desoldering gun because I am going to no doubt destroy something soon enough. So we're going to put a bit of fresh flux on there and we're just going to heat it up with the heat gun and hopefully free it without destroying anything. That is hot and you can, I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but you can see all the flux is steaming. Um, but the chip is out and from what I can see, all the pads are still intact. And I should have propped up the board, but the bench has survived. So that's good. Clean off all this flux. Hopefully I haven't damaged these coils. Doesn't look like I have, but they would have got quite hot being in such close proximity. Hopefully you can see just how short these legs are. Imagine the board they're sitting on the board. There is practically nothing sticking through the other side. Um, so all I'm going to do now is just go over with the desoldering gun and just make sure those holes are clear of any solder and then we'll put a socket in. Now let's just see what effect superheating this CIA chip has had on it. If it'll make good contact. Hmm. 
giving me a two. Yep, I boot up with a two now. Oh, we've got what looks like that color ram issue again. Hmm. Anyway, let's put a different CIA in and see what it does. All right, here's a known working CIA with some nice long legs. Well, I think we've still got the crazy color ram. My cursor's the right color. The rest of the text isn't, but the cursor's the right color. So yeah, I think we're done here. No, not really. Let's just swap this color ram out. Okay, that looks a lot better. So it could be just bad color ram. Um, but yeah, I think this CIA is definitely bad. So those two, I will double test in the, or double check in the test bed, but I'm pretty sure those two are gonna turn out to be bad. Um, let's hook up the diagnostic and see if we get any other craziness. Hmm. So this time cassette, user port are bad, and apparently U1 and U2 are bad. And it looks to have hung on the interrupt test. Okay, so I went around and cleaned up the edge connectors um, with fiberglass pen and just a bit of alcohol. And it looks like all the tests are now passing. So that is a good sign. Um, so I think for now we are done with this board. Um, and like I said in the previous video, we're going to come back and, and retest everything and clean everything up. All right, the bread bin. The label's trying to escape. I'll fix that later. There's a couple of cable burns here and there, but it's not too shabby for its age. And this one is made in England. Ooh. It's, it's quite shiny. There's very minimal rust. In fact, probably getting a lot of reflection off this. <laughs> Not used to things being so reflective inside these. Yeah, it's very clean. It's also been rated of its PLA and SID chip. So another 250425. Um, but yeah, very clean. Um, this has got one of those sort of solid Vic cans that's held in by a couple of solder joints. So the Vic is present though. So that's a good sign. Um, well, I at least need to put a PLA in there just so we can power it up and see what it does. All right, I'll just throw in one of these replacement PLAs. That'll at least be able to tell us if this thing is working at all. Uh, I guess connect some power. I don't think there's any reason to suspect anything strange going on here. It's almost like tape stuck under the fuse holder. A bit weird. Um, but yeah, given how clean it is, I think we're pretty safe to apply power and see what happens. All right, let's see. Looking like a black screen. Let's put the dead test in. Power's there. Oh, that's different. A red screen. 
Is it going to do anything else? No. Let's just reset it. Even the reset didn't have any effect. Usually it'll change or something, but it's just solid red screen. That's, yeah, that's new for me. <laughs> um, at the same time, that's exciting because it's something I've never seen before. So... Let's just check some voltages just to be sure. Five volt regulator is outputting 4.96, so that's good. And 12 volts is outputting 12.1, that is also good. We can see that there's five volts coming out, just checking from the power LED. Uh, we can also have a look over the other side of the board just to make sure. And there's five volts there. I've got the probe switched around the wrong way, but. We know it's five volts and 9.4 volts AC. So everything looks pretty healthy from a voltage perspective. Doesn't seem to be anything dragging that voltage down too much. Um, it hasn't been on for very long, but we'll just test, see if anything's getting unusually hot. It looks like they're all Hitachi RAM chips. None of them are hot. It's very unlikely that it will boot into the diagnostic. No. And it's not going to boot into basic. We're just going to have this red screen. Um, what I would like to do is get this can off so I can look uh, at the Vic and take some measurements from it. So I'll desolder this can and have a look underneath. All right, let's check the voltages on the Vic chip. So over this side at pin 40, we should have five volts, which we do. And pin 13, 20, should be 12 volts, which it is. That looks good. Let's look at some clock signals. Uh, pin 17 should be 985. Oops. 985 kilohertz, which is good. Um, we can look at the luminance clock, which... Yeah, this is 15, 16 kilohertz. So that looks about right. Um, color clock, 17.73 is good. And clock in is 7.87. That looks good as well. Um, so CPU should be looking good. 985 out. 985 in. Uh, let's move around to... Some basic logic, uh, just to see what's going on. It looks like there's activity everywhere. I'm seeing everything is pulsing. Uh, yep, 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 yep. It's A8 and A9. Just hit reset. Okay, so they do change on reset. Um, I'll just hook that in there. Let's just see what. Yeah, okay. So CPU reset gets pulled low and then goes back high. So that's good. I think what I'll do, um, given this weird red screen, which is actually a bit flickery, I might just pull the Vic chip out um, and just make sure everything's cleaned out underneath and then reinstall it, see if that gets us anywhere. This is, 
it's really in there. Wow, that took a lot of effort to pull out. Almost don't want to put it back in, it'll probably never get it out again. All right, let's see if that did anything at all. Probably not. All right, I think the next step is just to pull the Vic out and swap it over with a known working one. If I can get it out again, it should come out easier this time. That's better. All right. Throw this guy in. Oh, no red screen. That's a good sign. Chances are we're going to see a dead test about now. Well, that's not supposed to happen. I think it's resetting. <laughs> okay, let's see what happens this time. Mm. Screen RAM bad. Um, but I think that Vic is definitely bad. Um, I think this can is probably the worst design, this sort of solid metal one because um, unless it's actually definitely pushing down on the Vic it's not going to really be doing anything and they don't even put thermal compound under them or between the Vic and the can so they're probably yeah the most likely to end up with a cooked Vic underneath um, Go over to the diagnostic and see what it does. Ew. Doesn't do much by the looks of it. That's a lot of exclamation marks. Hey, it's added an extra plus to my diagnostic and an extra two or something as well by the looks of it. <laughs> oh, 3,719 bytes. I'm not even supposed to be in basic. Oh, yeah. Oh, Hachupru Kojiga Kaba. Hmm, interesting. And then back to basic with the wrong amount of bytes. Break. Well, yeah, we know that. Okay, now I'm just messing with it. Yeah, things are still not right. That's for sure. Oh, the basic looks fine now. It did take a bit long to boot up. Hmm, it's probably a good idea. I should take a break. Thanks, Commodore. So unfortunately, we're going to have to wait till next time to find out what's actually wrong with this bread bin. Uh, I think there could be something to do with the reset line, but uh, it's a choice of either getting this video out now or delaying it again, probably another couple of weeks until I get time to, to look at this. So keep your eyes out for part three, uh, where we hopefully 
sort this one out. And also we're going to go back as promised and make sure all our keyboards and things like that are working, all the peripherals. So there's still a lot more testing to do, uh, but the main thing is to get this one up and running. And then once we get them all complete, there will be also a restore-a-thon where we go through uh, the retro writing process that I use, the cleaning process, all those kind of things. So we'll get in depth. I haven't really showed uh, on the channel before what I actually do when I restore these things. So um, we'll dive a bit deeper into that and um, hopefully get ourselves some beautiful Commodore 64s at the end of it. So as always, thanks for watching the Retro Channel. Um, if you haven't already, be sure to hit subscribe, leave me some feedback, comments, like, dislike, share it around, and I will return for part three. Thanks for watching. Upside down typing. Space Invaders. Have one of them. <laughs>